today we start a new series, The X Factor. And uh, what is The X Factor? How many of you, a few years back, watched the television show The X Factor with Simon Cowell, huh? A few of you, okay. Three of you, fantastic. I can see I'm, I'm really in touch with uh, popular culture here. I can see that, yeah. Well, uh, that's not what I'm talking about today. That's not The X Factor. Uh, the X Factor is a phrase that's often used to describe a quality about someone uh, that makes them special. Sometimes we, we say that person has it, right? They've got it. They've got that X factor. I'm not talking about that today either. In algebra, <laughs> in algebra, X represents the unknown quantity in an algebraic equation. So, for example, we've got X plus 9 equals 25, right? And the X is that unknown quantity. In this case, what's X? Oh, oh I love you. You're so sharp. All right. I'm not talking about that either. In a mathematic equation... X means something else. 10x5. What's the X mean? Times or multiply, right? 10 times 5. Multiply. 10 times 5 is 50. That's what I'm talking about. You're going, you're going to talk about math today. Yes, I am. We're going to talk about the power of multiplication and why it's important to our mission. Our big deal is to create a culture of multiplication. I want to cast a vision today in the next couple weeks for us, each of us, becoming a follower of Jesus who thinks and acts as a multiplier that multiplies at every level. And as you can see from the outline, I'm going to unpack two really simple things today. I'm going to talk about the what very briefly and then spend a little bit more time on the why. Then the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about the how. All right? Before I dive in, I'm going to invite the ushers to come. If you brought an offering today or your tithe, uh, you know, everything we're going to talk about the next three weeks, all the ministry, all the multiplication, all of that... Uh, well, let's put it this way. Uh, how much money does it cost to do $100 worth of ministry? About $100, so thank you. Thank you for being generous. All right, while you're giving, let's go ahead and dive in here. Number one on your outline, create a culture of multiplication. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that we need to multiply at every level. I mean that we need to multiply if we're going to accomplish the mission that Jesus gave us. We've got to switch our thinking from simply adding to multiplying. If we're going to do what Jesus called us to do, we can't just add a few more disciples, a few more followers of Christ. We have to multiply followers of Jesus. If we want to do the mission Jesus gave us to do, we can't just add a few more leaders. We need to multiply leaders. If we want to do our mission, we can't just add a few more churches around town. We have to multiply churches everywhere. So let me just give you an example of the power of multiplication. And I think I've got a couple of, uh, huh? you guys going to come up and help me? Good. A couple of Northwest Leadership College students going to come up and help me with this. So g give them a little hand as they come up. And um, here's what we're going to do. All right. So Logan and Taylor, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got a thousand dollars here. Can you, can you, it's a thousand dollar bill. Is it real? Of course not. No, no. It's a photocopy. But we're going to pretend it's real, all right? I also have here in my pocket a penny. And this penny is real, by the way. Okay, so here's your choice. If I were to give you, if I were to offer you guys, and we're pretending it's real, either $1,000 or a penny, which would you take? $1,000. $1,000, dollars because you're poor college students. Yeah. That's right, yes. Yeah. How many of you would take the $1,000 as well? Okay, yeah, you'd be crazy, right? Got a choice between a thousand and a penny, take the thousand dollars. Let's switch it up a little bit. So I'm gonna offer you your choice. The thousand dollars every week for the next 52 weeks. Every week, another thousand dollars for 52 weeks. How much is that total at the end? 52 grand. Fi you're quick, you are quick. $52,000, how many of you would like $52,000? Okay, okay. So you can do that, thousand dollars a week for 52 weeks, or I could give you a penny today and next week I'll double it and I'll give you two pennies. And the week after that I'll double it again and give you four pennies. And the week after that I'll double it again and give you eight pennies and I'll do that for 52 weeks. Which do you want? The thousand dollars a week every week or the penny doubled? You're both gonna take the penny? That's a smart choice. That's a very smart choice because here's what you end up with. Double that penny every week. In the 52nd week, I'll be giving you 22,517,998,136,852 dollars and 48 cents. You made a wise choice. Yeah. So here, I'll give you the penny. Split it. Have fun. Thank you. God bless you. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you. 
That's the power of multiplication. That's the X factor. Here's the interesting thing. In the first few years of her life, the church of Jesus grew like that, multiplied, spread like a wildfire across the Roman Empire. And even today, there are places in the world where that's still happening. In Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, the church of Jesus is growing by multiplication, spreading very, very rapidly. But here in the West, in Europe, in North America, in Australia, the church has been in decline for some time. Not growing, but shrinking. Today, fewer than 20% of Americans attend church regularly, and that number continues to shrink steadily. Half of all churches, this to me is mind-blowing, half of all churches in America did not add a single person to their congregation by conversion last year. Not a single new person coming to Christ in over half the churches in America. A hundred years ago, there were 28 churches for every 10,000 people in our country. Today, there are 11 for every 10,000 people. Why is that? Because each year, somewhere between four and 7,000 churches in America will close their doors for good. It's a bleak picture. Instead of multiplying, we're losing ground. And as we'll see when we get to point two, Jesus calls us to make disciples of everyone, everywhere. And if we're to do that mission, if it's an everyone, everywhere mission, we can't just add a few people or a few churches or a few leaders. We have to multiply and spread like crazy. So what do we mean by create a culture of multiplication? Simply put, we want to add that value, that value of multiplying into every part of our church culture. We want to multiply at every single level. Let me just run through some of the levels, all right? We want to multiply disciples. That is, we want to multiply followers of Jesus. If you've been here very long, you've heard us say that our mission is very simple. Our mission is to help people find and follow Jesus. That's our mission, and everything we do is bent to this. But we're shifting our thinking just a little bit, and here's the shift. If we only think that way, just to add more followers of Jesus, we're adding, not multiplying. And so... The shift is, we not only want to multiply disciples, we want to multiply disciple makers. We want to shift our thinking so that everyone we help follow Jesus is trained to help other people follow Jesus. Every Jesus follower helps other people follow, who help other people follow, who help other people follow. We want to equip you not only to be a disciple, but to be a disciple who makes disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, and so on. In fact, here's kind of a radical thought, but I think it's true. You really haven't made a disciple until that person has made a disciple because that's what disciples do. Fundamentally, Jesus called us to catch people for God, right? He called us to be fishers of men, Jesus said. So part of being a follower of Jesus is helping other people find and follow Jesus. It's multiplying. And we want to shift our thinking so that we're constantly thinking about multiplying. We want to multiply leaders. We want every leader in our church to have a coach who's helping him get better but we also want every leader to have an apprentice someone that they're investing in so that they're not only leading but they're developing leaders around them we're multiplying leaders and not just adding them we want to multiply rooted groups and life groups if you've done rooted you already know that we ask every rooted facilitator to identify who are the people in your group that you think right now could facilitate another rooted group. In other words, we're asking them, multiply your group. We do the same thing with life groups. We ask every life group leader to identify an apprentice, someone that they're developing, who could in turn multiply their life group. Every group is multiplying. We want to multiply churches and sites. If you've been around Life Center very long, you know that in the last 20 years we've been planting churches. We currently have a network of 18 daughter and granddaughter churches. And in just the last two months, this is fun, I haven't told you this, but in just the last two months, three of our daughter churches have multiplied. One started a new church in Addy, Washington, north of here. Another started a new site here in our town. And a third started a new church out in the valley. And so we're multiplying churches, and we want to pour gas on that fire, multiply more churches, more sites, so that more people can find and follow Jesus. And then a new one, this is a new thought just this year, we want to multiply networks of multiplying churches. What do we mean by that? Well, a network of multiplying churches is simply we, we identify half a dozen churches that want to multiply, want to plant other churches. We pull them together so that they synergize, so that they help each other. We're better together rather than trying to do it ourselves. And uh, next month in April, uh, you'll like this, uh, 
I am flying with three other church planting pastors here in Spokane back to Chicago for a one-day training on how to start and lead these kinds of networks. And uh, usually the way this is done, this, this group that we're working with in Chicago, um, you would pay a, a substantial fee and, uh, and then one person could go back, one pastor could go back and then come back and start one network. Well, we called up this group in Chicago and negotiated with them and said, we wanna pay one fee, but we wanna send four pastors because we're thinking multiplication and uh, so for the one fee, we want to train four guys and come back, and we're going to start four networks right out of the chutes. And, uh, and they said yes. So we're doing that. So anyway, uh, that's happening. So again, the whole purpose of that is pull these churches together because we're better together. We're better working together than by ourselves. And we're going to have these networks that will be planting new churches and in, in the end result, creating new networks until eventually it's a movement we're looking for a movement of churches that are multiplying, uh, multiplying disciples, multiplying leaders, multiplying groups, multiplying churches and sites, multiplying networks. We want to create a culture of multiplication, multiplying at every level. We want to think X, not plus. Multiply, not addition. All right, so there's the what. I'll finish with the why, and uh, this is kind of the, 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 the biblical substructure for this thinking. And uh, the why, simply put number two in your outline, the why is to fulfill our God-given mission. What is that mission? What's the mission that God has given to us? And by us, I mean us, Life Center, but I mean us, the church, capital C. All Christians everywhere, you, me, all of us, Jesus gave us a mission. Let's unpack it from a few scriptures here. The first one, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. These are the words of Jesus He's been raised from the dead. He's met with his apostles, his disciples. He's getting ready to ascend back to heaven, and here's what he says. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. All right, what do we call this passage? We have a name for it. Anyone know what it's called? The Great Commission, right? This is the Great Commission. Jesus' final words, and he's, he's commissioning his followers, us, and saying, here's your mission. Here's what I want you to go do. Now, in the Great Commission, there are four verbs. And one of those verbs is the primary verb. The four verbs are go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. One of those verbs is the primary verb. It is imperative in mood. That means it's a command. The other three verbs are participle, meaning that they're verbal adjectives that help describe how to do the primary command. Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Which one's the primary verb? Everyone says go because it's first, but it's not go. It's make disciples. That's the primary verb. The command in this passage, when Jesus commands his, his followers and says, here's your job, he says, make disciples. Make disciples. The other three are participles, and we typically in English translate participles with an I-N-G at the end. Going, baptizing, teaching. Literally, in all you're going, wherever you go, make disciples, baptizing and teaching them. That's the Great Commission. Now, Jesus does add one little thing in here. He says, make disciples of what? All nations. Make disciples of all nations. Every race, every ethnicity, every nation. Make disciples of everyone, everywhere. Take this good news around the world. Tell everyone. And if we're going to do that, what we're saying is we've got to multiply. We've got to multiply and not just add. The Great Commission has been the impetus for 20 centuries of missionary work around the world. Millions of Christians have left their homes, their cultures, their friends and families, and have gone somewhere around the world to take the good news of Jesus. But I want to remind you today that that work, that work of multiplying, that work of taking the good news to everyone everywhere, while it ends up around the world, it starts where? It starts right here. It starts here in Spokane, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, and in our workplaces. It starts here. When I was in high school, uh, one night in our youth group, uh, we were talking about missions and missionaries. I don't even remember the context. I just remember that's what we were talking about. And, and a couple of my fellow students said, I, you know, I think one day, you know, one day later as an adult, I'm going to be a missionary somewhere in the world. And I sat there dumbfounded. And here's why I was like shocked 
because I knew these students, and as far as I knew, none of them were actively sharing their faith, sharing Jesus with anybody at our school. And that's why I was dumbfounded. I was sitting there thinking, how in the world could you possibly think about flying halfway around the world to tell someone about Jesus when you won't walk across the hall at school to do it? It's got to start where? Here. It's got to start here. By the way, this is exactly what Jesus told the disciples. Acts chapter 1. This is Luke's version of the Great Commission. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Jesus says, or it says here, then they, the disciples, gathered around him, around Jesus, and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You'll be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, right where you're standing. That's where they were at the moment. I'll come back to that thought. Go back up to verse 6 for just a moment. Then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Their vision was too small. They were still thinking that the kingdom of God was the same thing as the kingdom of Israel, right? They were still thinking that the kingdom of God was really just about them and their people, the people of their race, their nation. They certainly weren't thinking of all the nations. They weren't thinking of the ends of the earth. They were thinking about themselves and people like them. And Jesus is about to blow that up in a big way. One of the reasons, by the way, that it's hard for us sometimes to think about multiplying is that like these early disciples, our vision tends to be too small. It tends to be too self-centered. For God so loved the world. That's God's vision right there. God's vision is for the whole world. But you know how I often read this? For God so loved. Come on, isn't that true? We tend to read it through our own personal lens. For God so loved me and my family and a few of my friends. It's how we tend to think. We're just naturally selfish. You know, one time I was giving a message like this here at Life Center. I was talking about how our church is a church for others, that we exist not just for ourselves, but for the people outside our walls, for the people who haven't heard, for people who are still far from God. And after I was done with that message, uh, uh, one of our owners here at Life Center came up to me and she said, but what about us? What about those of us that are already here? And I told her, I, I, I assured her, I said, look, we want to help you follow Jesus. We want to help everyone here follow Jesus. Absolutely. But I also thought that her question sounded a lot like Acts 1-6 that our focus naturally gravitates to ourselves. What about us? What about restoring the kingdom to Israel? And what I'm suggesting to you today is that if we're going to think like God thinks, if we're going to think like Jesus thinks, we've got to get past ourselves. It can't just be about us. What if being a Christian isn't just about you? What if it's not just about your salvation? What if it's not just about you going to heaven? What if it's not just about you having a better life? What if it's about the whole world? What if it's about everyone around you? So is Jesus for you? Come on, folks. Is Jesus for you? Absolutely, he's for you. But it can't stop there. It starts there, but it can't stop there. Jesus is for everyone. Jesus is for everyone. And so the disciples come at Jesus with this very small vision. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to us and to our little circle of people like us? And Jesus blows their minds and he says, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And when he does, you're going to receive power and you're going to receive power to be my witnesses. What does a witness do? Think, think of court. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Right? Sit down and ask, okay, what does a witness do? Tells the truth and specifically tells the truth about what they've seen, what they've heard, and what they know. Right? Here's what I saw, here's what I heard, here's what I know. And they tell the truth about it. That's a witness. And Jesus says, the Spirit's going to give you power, and you are going to be my witnesses. You're going to be witnesses of Jesus. You're going to tell what you've seen, what you've heard, what you know about Jesus. And one of the things I've learned that's, I think, really fun, I think that it's pretty easy to talk about Jesus. I've discovered that when I talk about Jesus, most people are interested in Jesus. In fact, here's the cool thing. Most people like Jesus. Do you know what I'm saying? 
Most people like Jesus. They don't always like Christians. They don't always like church. They don't always like religion or even Christianity, but most people like Jesus. So I'm on this congressional civil rights pilgrimage. There were 29 members of Congress on this, and I had some fabulous conversations with several of them. And uh, one of them, we were, we were standing and talking. The, uh, the, the, uh, the event is sponsored by uh, Faith in Politics, uh, which is a group that's designed to bring Republicans and Democrats together in, an, in a non-political setting, in this case, in this pilgrimage, uh, where they can be friends, where they can talk, they can get to know each other, and hopefully build some bridges. And so I was talking with one of the Congress people about this, and she was just saying how wonderful it was that... Republicans and Democrats were on this trip together. They were listening to each other. Uh, They were becoming friends. She was just talking about how wonderful that was. And I responded by saying, that is one of the things I love about being a follower of Jesus. That Jesus is all about bringing people together. And she got kind of a surprised look on her face and said, really? She said, I'm not a Christian, and I, I wonder why you think that. And I said, well, Jesus came to bring us back to God. And as he brings us back to God, he brings us closer to each other. He breaks down the walls between us. That he came not only to reconcile us to God, but to reconcile us to each other. And here's what he said. Someone asked him once, what's the most important thing you can do? What's the greatest of all the commandments? And Jesus said, love God. Love God with all you've got, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor like yourself. That's what Jesus calls us to do. To love God and to love each other. And this lady who self-identified as not being a Christian, smiled and said, I like that. And I said, everyone likes Jesus. Really think about it. Everyone likes Jesus. And, uh, and then I, I kind of did a little shift on her, and I said, that's why I like talking to people about Jesus and why I identify with him rather than starting by saying I'm a Christian. This time she got really surprised and said, you mean you're not a Christian? <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm a Christian. But I don't lead with that, and here's why. I said, what comes to your mind when I say the word Christian? And sure enough, she starts taking off, you're against this, you're against this, you're against this, you're against this. I said, and what comes to your mind when I say Jesus? And she smiled and said, I've never thought of it that way. It was so much fun. I had a lot of fun conversations like this, but what I'm telling you is that talking about Jesus is really easy. You wanna know why? Because Jesus is the most awesome person who ever lived. Jesus is really cool, and I, I find very few people that don't like Jesus, and so start there. Just start there with the person of Jesus and create some interest and intrigue. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses. You're going to go everywhere and talk about me. Where are we going to do that? He says, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem is where they were standing when Jesus said this. It's the city they were in, right? So what's our Jerusalem, folks? Spokane. You're sitting in Jerusalem right here. Yep. So we start in Spokane, and then Judea. So Jerusalem was kind of the capital of Judea. Judea would have been like the nation. So everybody in Judea, were, they were all Jews, and Jerusalem was their capital. So you're going to start in Jerusalem, the city you're in. You're going to go out into the surrounding area that is it's still your people. Who would that be for us? Okay, someone said Washington, Pacific Northwest. The United States, right? I mean, it's still, it's still our people. We're all Americans. So start in Spokane, spread out across the U.S., and then Jesus says, goes, he says, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. What was Samaria? Well, Samaria was the next country beyond Judea, but the people there were different. These were not our people anymore. Different race, different religion, different language, different. These are different people. So Spokane, the U.S., What's our Samaria? Canada, right, yeah. They're really different up there. Okay, yeah, you know, I mean, it could be Canada, it could be Mexico, there's a lot of places it could be, but here's the thing. It could also be that refugee family just down the street. It could also be the couple across the street, different religion than you. It could be the person a couple blocks down of a different race. But again, this, the idea is 
these are not my people, right? These are people that are different than me. And Jesus says, we're moving out now from the city where we started to the nation where everyone's like us, out into the world where people are different. And then finally Jesus says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to what? The ends of the earth. And you know what? The ends of the earth then and the ends of the earth now are pretty much still the ends of the earth, right? Yeah, yeah. Pretty much everywhere. So what Jesus is saying is, look, I want you to take this message and take it to everyone everywhere. In fact, will you just say those two words with me? Everyone everywhere. Let's say it together. Everyone everywhere. And if we're going to do that, we've got to multiply. We've got to think multiplication. Not just addition, but multiplication. All right, one more classic multiply scripture from Paul to Timothy. This is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul writes to Timothy, And the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Here's a multiply verse right here. There are four generations in this verse. Starts with Paul. Paul teaches Timothy. He passes the gospel to Timothy. He tells Timothy, Timothy, entrust this gospel to reliable people. There's a third generation who in turn will pass it on to others. Paul, Timothy, reliable people, others. But notice the verb there. Look again at verse 2. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. What's Timothy supposed to do? What's the verb? Entrust. Have you ever thought about that word? What's it mean to entrust something? It means you take something valuable, you take something important, and you give it to another person, and you trust them to either take care of it or do something with it, right? I'm entrusting you with something. So for example, I got a financial planner each month. I, I entrust him with a little bit of my money. What do I expect him to do with it? Get a burger and a Coke. <laughs> I'm expecting him to what? to invest it wisely and make me filthy rich when I'm about 250, something like that. But that's the idea, right? I'm entrusting him with something that's valuable or important. Lane and I have a dog. Our dog's name is Maisie. We've got a picture of Maisie. Look at that face. How do you not love that face, huh? Well, I love Maisie, but when we leave town, we can't just leave her there. So we found a young couple that is willing to care for Maisie while we're gone, and we entrust our dog to her. And it's important to me that, that I'm not just leaving her with anybody. It's important to me that someone that's going to love her and take care of her. She's going to be happy to see them when I drop her off, and she's going to be happy to see me when I pick her up. Before I went on the pilgrimage a week ago, I sat down with Pastor David, and we talked about the last message in that Me Too series. I thought, this is an important series, and this is a really, really important wrap-up message. And so I talked with David, and, and basically I, I entrusted him with what I thought was a very, very important message to give to you. And David didn't let me down. He did what I expected. He crushed it. He did a great job. And I use that illustration to say that God's entrusted you with a message too. Every single one of you have been entrusted with the good news of Jesus. Think about that. That God's taken something that's incredibly valuable, incredibly important, and he's given it to you and he expects you to do something with it. And part of what he expects us to do is to pass that on. Pass it on to reliable people who can pass it on to others. Multiply the message. And I decided a long time ago, I want to be one of those reliable people that Paul's talking about in this passage. I want to be one of those people that God can count on that when he entrusts me with something, I'm going to use it and do what he wants. And I'm praying that every one of you will be one of those reliable people too, that as God entrusts his message, his good news, the message of Jesus, that you're gonna take that trust seriously and make sure that you pass Jesus along, that you multiply and fulfill your mission. So there's the why, there's the what, and I just wanna finish with one last thought, it's real short, real simple, but it's very personal. I wanna make it personal for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Should not perish. Who do you know that is perishing? You know, this verse says that without Jesus, we perish. Eternal life is now and forever. Eternal life starts when you begin following Jesus, it lasts forever. And perishing is now and forever. That without Jesus, right now, 
we're perishing. That is, right now, we are missing out on the life that God intended for us. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. There's a thief, there's a spiritual adversary who wants to steal your life, who wants to kill and destroy you. But Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus comes to bring life to the full. I just said eternal life doesn't start when you die. Eternal life starts right now as you begin to follow Jesus. It's a life that's full now. It's a life that lasts forever. It's a life that's eternal, both in quality and in quantity. And without Jesus, it says, without Jesus, we miss out on that life. Without Jesus, we're perishing. Even while we're breathing, we're still perishing. And as I thought about it this week, I just couldn't help but think back. You know, two, two weeks ago, I wrapped up the talk by describing to you just very, very briefly the chaos in my home as I grew up. I told you that my dad was an alcoholic and that when he was drunk, he was a violent drunk. He was abusive. His dad was an alcoholic. And I don't know how many generations it goes back before then, but you can do the research. If you've got that kind of a heritage in your background, you are nine times more likely to become an alcoholic yourself. If you grow up with abuse, you're far more likely to become an abuser. And I was looking back this week, I was just thinking about that and thinking about this cycle in my heritage, in my history, this cycle of alcoholism, this cycle of abuse. And then I realized that Jesus broke that cycle with me, that he stepped in and rescued and redeemed me, that without Jesus, that's where I would be. Without Jesus, I would probably still be caught up in that, that cycle of alcoholism and abuse. And I'm just telling you, when I was sitting thinking about this, I started crying and just saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. I was just so grateful that he saved me and redeemed me. Who do you know that's perishing? Maybe it's you. Maybe you're missing out on that abundant life. And if that's you, in just a moment, we're gonna pray and we'll give you a chance to say yes to Jesus and start a whole new kind of life. Or maybe it's a friend of yours or a family member. Who do you know that's perishing? This is why Jesus came, and this is the message that's entrusted to us that transforms lives and saves people. Let's pray. I'm gonna invite you right now to take a moment and pray for the person that came to your mind. I asked you, who do you know that's perishing? And would you just pray for that person right now? Ask Jesus to intercept them. Ask Jesus to intervene in their lives and draw them to himself. Ask Jesus to save them. I'll give you a moment. Just whisper their names. He'll hear you. Lord, we pray for these people we love. And we pray, Lord, that you would save them. Just like you've saved us, save them intervene in their lives and help them come alive, fully alive in Christ. And give us the chance, Lord, give us the chance to simply share you with them. And then I wanna just finish, Lord, by asking if there's anybody in the room who is perishing. Anyone who right now is thinking, I'm not living that abundant life. I need that. I need Jesus in my life that this could be their moment right now, Lord, to whisper that yes and start a brand new life in Christ. And friends, if that's you, would you do that right now? Just whisper a yes to him. Yes, Lord. Yes, I believe. Yes, I'll follow. Yes, Jesus. He'll hear you. And then if you've whispered that yes, would you lift your head, look at me, and then wave your hand at me and say, Pastor Joe, that's me. I want you to know I'm saying yes to Jesus today. Would you do that? Thank you, sir. Good for you, good for you, thank you too, good for you. Back there, thank you, I see you, good for you. All right, don't let me miss you. Way in the back, thank you so much. Over here, thank you, and you too. Very good, right back here, good. Down here, thank you, sir, good for you. All across the room, Lord, thank you for every person 
who just made the most important decision they'll ever make in their lives, the decision that really does radically transform our entire trajectory. Thank you for that, for each one of them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you'd like to pray with someone, we'll have folks available down front. If you're new, if you've got questions, if you want to know how to get involved, swing by the Welcome Center on your way out. Have a great week.